So hello, today we're going to start chapter eight. Um, it's kind of like a now for something completely different moment. We've been talking a lot about waves and light and they've all been linking up and we've been doing a lot of shared stuff. And I'm like, yeah, okay, it's completely jump topics. And we are going to talk electricity and magnetism. Now in a full on physics course, these, this chapter would be half a semester, if not more. Um, but we're going to kind of do at a low level some very, very base electricity. I know a lot of you with different majors have done some stuff with electrical, but this is going to be from the physics standpoint. Now, before I get into it, I do want to point out this is the last chapter on exam two. Um, your second exam is Wednesday, April 7th. That is one week from this Wednesday. Um, general idea is today I start chapter eight. Wednesday, I finish chapter eight. The following Monday, I will do review. The following Wednesday will be this exam. Just like last exam, it is 20 questions long, five problems from each chapter. And just like last exam, it goes online at noon and it has to be uploaded by 105. If you have an issue with that time, please let me know. I'm not gonna just automatically roll over all of the any time issues people had. Um, you're gonna have to let me know again. I will be on Zoom during the exam. I am greatly considering saying that you must be on Zoom during the exam with a camera on due to cheating on the last exam, but I, have, I haven't been 100% set there yet. Um, I might still allow you to not be on Zoom on this one, but, the final, but if the cheating happens again, the final exam would definitely be on Zoom. Um, so as of now, let me figure, think about that still. Um, it is about the same length as the last one. I, when I took it, I did it a little bit faster, but you need to account for the time. Once again, if you're opening up every single PowerPoint during the exam, you're not going to have enough time. If you're prepared, it should be plenty of time. Um, what I say is make yourself an equation sheet to have with you so you're not flipping through everything. You won't spend as much time going through it. Um, Last semester's exam is on Banco Hall. I will post solutions to it. Those solutions will be posted on the 5th when I go through it in class. Um, I also have a spot to upload the practice exam. It's not to be collected or graded, it's just so you can see the exact format it was in last semester. Any questions about this exam before I get on with chapter eight? Okay, let's do it. We're going to talk about electricity. And I mean, it's the kind of thing you all use. Um, I sit in this room, I won't say I don't really change my notes for online, but you're all using electricity to watch this right now. Like without electricity, you would not be getting this lecture. And most people can understand the use for electricity, but very few people understand what it's doing. The idea that it's something with electrons is commonly known. And people can understand voltage and current and know, you know how much voltage you need, how much current you need. But what is the physics behind it? What is actually happening is actually not that commonly known. Magnets are even worse, which I instantly want to quote Insane Clown Posse, but let's not go too inappropriate for class. Um, some of the stuff you're going to see in this chapter, you might have seen in different classes, especially for those of you in applied tech. But I'm going to view it all from the physics standpoint. So you might see some of the stuff in a slightly different form. Um, that's the general idea. Now, the first real discoveries in electricity was with the realization of electric charge. Benjamin Franklin, in around 1750, um, realized that electrical charge existed and comes in two flavors. He said there's such a thing as positive electric charge and negative electric charge. Uh, quick thing on this, he arbitrarily decided one piece was positive and one piece was negative. Um, he guessed wrong. It's still how we decide it. We still what he called negative, we call negative, we call positive, we call positive. But if we had defined it the opposite order, if we had switched called positive, negative, negative, positive, all of the math would have been so much easier. So, oops, that's annoying, such is life. Uh, a little bit later, about 50 years later, the atom was discovered. And people realized that all matter is made up of little hunks of metal. And much later, about 100 years after that, people realized that the atom is made up of two different particles. 
the electron and the proton, and later on also the neutron. We're going to do this in more detail in a few chapters. And people realized that everything, all metal, is made up of these atoms. And these atoms that make up all metal are just electrons, protons, and neutrons. And this idea, the Benjamin Franklin's realization of positive and negative charges, uh, was very instrumental in working out what the atom is and how the atom works. Because what people realize is these pieces that make up the atom, the electrons, the protons, and the neutrons, have charges. Now, uh, no, the neutrons don't. Neutrons have no charge. And so for the most part, we're not going to talk about them this chapter. They'll come up more later on. But electrons and protons have an electric charge. Electrons have a negative charge. And in fact, if you want, you can give an exact value. And protons have a positive charge. Now, electric charge is usually measured in the units of coulombs. Coulomb gets the symbol capital C, where coulomb is defined as an amp second. Um, an amp is a fundamental unit. We haven't covered it yet. I will get there later on this chapter. Um, but the symbol for a charge will always be Q, and the unit will be Coulombs, capital C. And actually, we worked out the charge of an electron and a proton, where the charge of an electron is negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 Coulombs, and the charge of a proton is positive 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 Coulombs. And everything with electricity, everything is just these electrons and protons doing various things. And to be fair, it's really just the electrons doing various things and the protons just sitting there chilling and letting it happen around them. That protons are there and they exist and they have some ability, but really all of electricity is just the movement of electrons and the movement of their charge. Now, as I already said, everything is made up of electrons, protons, and neutrons. Both, most materials, by nature, naturally, have the same number of protons and electrons. And so if protons and electrons have the exact same value of charge, just negative from each other. Once again, I said it was negative 1.6 times 10 negative 19 and positive 1.6 times 10 negative 19. And so let's say something has four protons and four electrons, like my picture in the bottom left its total charge will be zero because they can cancel each other out. But what happens is you can change the amount of electrons on something. It's of note you can change the number of protons on something, but that involves like a particle accelerator and millions of dollars and, you know, yeah, a particle accelerator, not really going to happen. But you can change the number of electrons. And if something loses electrons, it'll become positively charged because it'll have more protons than electrons. And if something gains extra electrons, it'll become negatively charged because it'll have more electrons than protons. And that you can easily do this. That if I just take this balloon and like rub it up against my shirt, it can like stick to things after that. That's because by rubbing against my shirt, I change the amount of electrons on it. By rubbing against, I move some electrons. It's very easy to move electrons. What happens is if you have charged objects, AKA, they have a charge at all, charged objects will react with each other. Whenever two objects with a non-zero charge are near either, they follow something called the law, um, the law of charges. What the law of charges says is like charges repel, unlike charges attract. That if you have two charged objects, if they have the exact same charge, if they're both positive, they'll repel away from each other. If you have two charged objects and they're both negative, they'll repel away from each other. But a positive and negative charge will attract each other. And so anytime you have two charged objects, they will either repel in a straight line directly apart or attract in a straight line directly together depending on if they have the same charge as each other or the opposite charges of each other. Okay. Now you can actually see this. If you take a glass rod and rub it with silk, it'll gain a charge. The reason why is the silk will pull electrons from the glass rod. 
making the glass wad have a positive charge. The total charge remains constant. What is is the glass wad will become positive and the silk will become negative because it gains some extra electrons. But yeah, you just take a glass wad and rub it with silk, it becomes a charged object with a positive charge. If you take a rubble rod and rub it with silk, it actually goes the other way. It'll take electrons and rip them off the silk and put them on the rubble rod. And what will happen is the rubble rod will become negatively charged. And so if I do this and start rubbing these rods, interesting statements, this right here is a rubble, oops. This right here is a rubble rod I just rubbed with silk. If I take another rubble rod and rub it with silk, oh, they are oh going to, to repel each other. It's as I get close, it, you can see that it turns around and goes in the opposite direction. The reason why is they both have negative charges. They repel. But if I take the glass rod and rub with silk, uh, right now it has, I am getting it to accelerate in a circle. And if I put it here, I can get it to stop and come back around. It is attracted to the glass rod. It's attracted to the glass rod because the glass rod and the rubber rod have opposite charges. The, glass, the rubber rod is negative, the glass rod is positive, and so they attract each other. Make sense? So, once again, same charge, repel. Opposite charge, attract. This is the same idea of a static charge. Like if you rub your feet against the culprit, you get it, you can like zap something. <laughs> Every single time my wife gets up from the couch, she gets an electric zap and it makes me laugh. Um, the reason why, like the same as my short rubbing heel, but the reason why if you're like walking on a culprit and you give yourself a charge is because just friction. Anytime you have friction, you can move some electrons. And if you like rub your feet on a culprit and touch something, the zap you feel is that you either gained or lost electrons. If you touch something metal, that zap you feel is you transferring electrons to make it so that your total charge is zero. Of note, it normally only happens when it's dry, when it's not humid. The reason why is when things are humid, there's a thin film of water, which can keep the, the friction from happening, keep the charge from happening. To make a big deal with gas tanks is you should always have your gas tank on the ground when you fit it. The reason why is things touching the earth usually don't stay charged. The earth has a lot of electrons and protons, and it has so many that just abbing off by a few is basically nothing. Anytime you touch something to the earth, you ground it. What grounding does is it'll just make it go back to the total amount of electrons um, zero. Oh, sorry, that's the total amount of electrons. The total charge zero. The difference between electrons and protons will be zero. It will still have electrons. And so if you have your um, gas tank in the back of a truck, it might have a static charge. If it has a static charge, when you touch a thing to it, it might have a zap. You get a little static zap next to gasoline, that can be bad. But that's no idea. Things can get charged. There's actually a device made for harnessing static electricity called a Van de Graaff generator. And I'm going to turn my sound on for this. A Van de Graaff generator is this thing that has this belt, this rubble belt that, um, it could be something else, but mine's rubble, that goes over these teeth and causes friction, and it collects charge. And what it does is you put a metal dome over it, and it'll collect charge and make a thing statically charged. And it's kind of neat, because if you take one of these and get up to full speed and bring something grounding next to it, can get the static charge. What this is, is literally, I am just going and causing friction and causing this dome to be positively charged. When I bring this grounding object up against it, it's going to try to minimize the charge. And it's going to take extra electrons off the stick. It's the stick. It's going to take extra electrons from the stick causing these little lightning bolts you see as it tries to bring the charge back to zero. Any questions though? Now, it's all well and good to say that we can 
Opposite charges attract, like charges repel. But we can actually mathematically solve it. There was something called Coulomb's law. And Coulomb's law is actually the mathematical quantity for the, for the force between two charged objects. And Coulomb's law says anytime you have two charged objects, the force they feel will be k sub e, which is known as Coulomb's constant. k sub e just has a value of 8.99 times 10 to the ninth Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared, times the charge of one object, q1, times the charge of the other object, q2, times divided by the distance between them squared. And this will say anytime you have two charged objects, how strong will be the attractive force? How strong will be the repulsion force? Now note this equation might look a little similar because it looks a lot like the full equation for gravity. That gravity says it's F equals G M1 M2 over R squared and Coulomb force says it's F K E Q1 Q2 over R squared. The fact that these look so similar is not really a coincidence. And there's a reason they're so similar, although that gets into some very complicated math, so I'm not going to go into it. One of the big differences, though, is the Coulomb's law can be pulse or attract, that you can make things move away or shove them together. Gravity can only attract. Also, the Coulomb force is much, much, much stronger than the gravitational force. But fun fact, this Coulomb's force is why an atom it can exist. Without a Coulomb force, atoms could not exist. And if atoms didn't exist, nothing would exist. So it's kind of important. Now of note, when you put values into this equation, if both your Q's are positive, you'll get a positive value of F. If both your Q's are negative, the negatives will cancel out and you'll get a positive value of F. Anytime your value of F is positive, that means it's a repulsive force that is going to have them repulse each other, move apart. However, if one of your forces is positive and one of your forces is negative, that will be an attractive force because you have them positive times a negative. And so anytime you have a positive and negative, you will have an attractive force. Any questions? Let's do an example problem. A hydrogen atom is made up of one electron and one proton separated by one angstrom, when angstrom is one times 10 to negative 10 meters. What is the magnitude of the force holding together the atom? If I want to find the magnitude of this force, this is my equation for force. Well, k sub e, earlier I said 8.99 times 10 to the ninth. That's pretty close to 9 times 10 to the ninth. Um, I thought I changed the slide to say nine times 10 to the ninth, but I didn't. I need to fix that. I will fix that after. What I'll do is I'll just plug into my equation that the force is 8.99 times 10 to the ninth Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared times the charge of one of object, the charge of the ob object over the distance squared. This will allow me to plug in some numbers and get a value. It's a negative value. That means the negative value means it's attractive. Any questions? OK. Make myself a note to fix that. Interesting thing. So I said when I rub this balloon against my shirt, I can make it get attracted to me. I can get it attracted to me using Coulomb's force. That balloon doesn't stick to the wall. If I rub it against my shirt, balloon now well, doesn't stick very well. There you go. Now it sticks to the wall. This is kind of weird because what I did is I gave a charge to the balloon, but I didn't necessarily give a charge to the wall. The wall won't have a charge. Sometimes things that are not charged will react to charged objects. This is called polarization of charge. See, the balloon, it definitely gets charged. You can see the balloon gets charged if I just take the balloon and bring it near the Van de Graaff generator. 
that when I take the balloon and throw it at the Van de Graaff generator, it gets repulsed. You can see that, especially with that first one. But the reason it sticks to the wall is because after this is charged, when I bring it towards the wall, what happens when I charge this balloon? Is when I rub this against my shirt, it gets a positive charge. It's losing electrons. And this now has a positive charge. If I bring it towards a conducting object, let's see if this will work well. Not quite enough. If I bring it towards a conducting object, what it's going to do is it's going to cause, with Newton's law, charges to move inside the object. And it's going to want to go. Nope, I can't get to stick to that. It's going to want to go. Probably my arm would work better. Um, it's the negative charges are going to get close to the balloon. And the positive charge will get further away from the balloon. And what's going to happen is it won't change the number of charges, it will just change the location of the number of charges. All the negative charges will come near the edge, being attracted. And all the positive charges will go further in, getting repulsed. And what's going to happen is it'll align the charges inside the object. When I, ba -ba -da, when I put this up against the wall, the wall is not charged. It's just heal. The wall has its charges line up, line up so that the negatives are near the edge, the positives are further in. And this is called polarization, or it is polarized. See, the reason this works, the reason the balloon sticks, is because Coulomb's law goes by distance. And I already said I could do this. And because the negative charges are closer, they're going to feel a stronger force. The positive charges, which are further away, will, are further away. They feel a smaller force. And so the negative force can win out, causing it to attract. And that's why you have something statically charged. You can attract like hair or like make your hair stand up or like have it stick to the wall. Any questions so far? You guys are always so quiet. So I'm always not sure if you're just getting it or just so lost you don't want to say anything. <laughs> or just, you know, not paying attention at all. So, that's the general idea, polarization charge. But e mostly we're going to do with charged objects. So a non-charged, uh, sorry, a charged object can get attracted to a non-charged object. But for the most part, we'll just deal with two charged objects. Now, of note, when I have this charged object, and do I have this? Did I make this video in the end? Hold on. Nope, I didn't. When I take charged objects, there is something that surrounds it called an electric field. An electric field is kind of an interesting thing. It's what it is, though, is it's just a way of visualizing how a charged object would look nearby. What it is, is if you make a charged object, I'm going to charge this balloon. If I make this balloon charged, I could say, if I took a second charge object and brought it forward, how would it react? Would it be repulsed? If it was repulsed, in what direction? Would it attract? If it was attracted, would it be straight towards it? And what the field is, is a way of direction saying how another charge object would react. And you would normally assume your other object, your other charge object, is a positive charge. But it's a, if you have brought a positive chest charge, what would happen? And so electric field lines are just saying, where would a positive charge go? So it's always going to be away from a positively charged object and towards a negatively charged object. And this is exactly what path it would take. Basically, if I was to put a positive object right here, I could say, what would happen to that positive object? Is it would just go down this line. If I was to put a positive object right there, it would just go down this line. That's the general idea. Uh, and just you can see how it's normally measured. You take a test charge of value Q naught, whatever that is, and just kind of move it around. And at all points, measure the force. And you get a map of what it looks like. And we'll say the value for the electric field, the electric field uses the symbol E, is going to be the force at each point divided by the magnitude of our test charge. And that'll let us see exactly what this electric field is, where the units are newtons per coulomb. And the direction is just what direction the force is. 
Now, for a point charge, it's pretty straightforward. It's either everything is pushed straight away or everything is pushed straight towards each other. But if you have multiple charged objects, this will tell you exactly how a charge would act. Let's say you would have drawn the electric field lines for instead of just a point charge, but a positive and negative charge next to each other, or two positive charges next to each other. This will show exactly how a charged object would act. And so if you were to put a charged object like right here, you'd know, say, if I put a charged object right here, the path it would take, would it would be follow this path and go down like this green arrow. Well, let's do red, that shows up better. If I was to put a positive chest object right here, it would go like this and follow this blue arrow. It'll say exactly how it moves, always going from positive to negative following these lines. Also, anytime the lines are closer together, like they are here versus out here, that means a stronger electric field. That means the, feel, the thing would feel a stronger force. Where the force it would feel would just be the bang to the electric field times the value of the charge you put in it. Okay. Now let's say you do this. Let's say you make an electric field. There's a lot of ways to make an electric field. That's basically what a battery is. A battery is something that gets into the idea of a capacitor that just causes an electric field. And if you take an electric field and put an electron in it, it feels a force. This is how it value it would have. However, if you apply a force to an electron, it's going to accelerate. F equals ma. And so if you give an electric field, if you give an electron some force, it's going to move. And we can talk about what happens when electrons move. If you're if your electrons or the net charge total, not necessarily each electron, but the total net charge begins to move, you have what is called a current. Current, which uses the symbol capital I, is the time rate flow of charge. It is not the speed of electrons. It is how much charge passes through an area in a time period and uses the unit of ampule. Ampule using the symbol capital A. Now, most people don't say ampule. They just say amps. Amps is just a shorthand, an abbreviation of an ampule. And amps is perfectly acceptable. You also sometimes hear people talking about amperage. Amperage is just current. It's just it's measured in amps, so people call it amperage. But amperage or current is the flow of electrons, the amount of charge that moves in a set time period. See, how it amp amperage can really be solved is amperage is saying how much positive charge goes through an area. Let's say I got a pipe, and this pipe has a cross-section A. If I tell you, if you know how many electrons travel, or sorry, how many protons travel in a set time period, I can solve for the charge that passes through. See, I know the charge of one proton. Charge of one proton is 1 1.6 times 10 to negative 19. Let's say 10 protons go through. If 10 protons go through, then it's going to be 1.6 times 10 to negative 18 times 10. That's the charge that passes through. Current is how much charge passes through in, an, in a poor time. So let's say in one second, in one second, these three protons pass through. If in one second, these three protons pass through, what I would say is the current is the charge of a proton times three protons over one second, the time that passes through. That's what current is defined as, the direction positive charge flows. And how much total charge, so how many protons times time, oh, sorry, how many protons times the charge of a proton in that time period. Here's the thing, though. Protons don't flow. Electrons do. This goes back to what I said Benjamin Franklin guessed wrong. Electrons are what flow. But current is defined as the motion of positive charge. And so really current should be defined as how many electrons pass through times the charge of an electron divided by the time. But the direction that current is defined, whatever direction current is defined moving, that means the, the electrons are moving the opposite way because they have a negative charge. Benjamin Franklin decided what was positive, what was negative. He didn't know, have any reason to know which was better. 
and just arbitrarily picked because that used his knowledge and picked it backwards. And so whenever you say current is going one way, that means electrons are moving the opposite direction. And the magnitude of the current, the amperage, will just be what is, how much charge passed through in that time period. Any questions? Now, some materials can easily have electrons move. These are called conductors. Metals are conductors. Gold is one of the best conductors, and copper is up there also. Not quite as good. Conductors, just the electrons can easily flow. And you put you put an electric field, and the electrons just go phew, right down the wire. Other materials, electrons can't move easily in. Anything that is an insulator is something where the electrons cannot move. That's like wood, glass, plastic. This guy's an insulator. That an insulator, electrons do not like to move, and they will stay in place. There are some things that are in between. The electrons can kind of move, but it's complicated. That's a semiconductor. Um, semiconductor physics is its own area of study entirely. It's actually what my PhD is in. We're not going to get into that because it's complicated as hell. But in a conductor, what happens if you cause an electric field, the electrons will just shoot down the wire, meaning you have a current in that opposite direction. We can actually work out exactly how fast the electrons shoot down the wire. That is called the drift velocity. Um, of note, the drift velocity for an electron is actually super slow. That if you have a current in a wire, and let's say our current is to the left, like in this diagram, you would say the direction the velocity electrons move is to the right. They actually don't go very fast. Really, they go fast, but they don't go in a straight line. They kind of ping pong their way over. So on average, they just slowly move to the direction. Um, yeah, the electrons move near the speed of light, but instead of going view across, they're going and just slowly making their way. Um, that seems electricity seems to go quickly because even at one millimeter per second, I mean one millimeter per second is not so slow when you look at how big of a millimeter is. It's just compared to how fast the electrons should be moving. Also, really, when you have a while, if you have a series of electrons, what you're going to have is the first electron is going to move. All the electrons are going to kind of move in unison because the first electron is going to hit the second electron, it's going to hit the third electron. And so instead of saying how long an electron goes, voop, it's going to be all the electrons shifting, right? When you want to talk about how fast an electron goes down a while, it's not going to be how fast this guy gets here, but this guy's going to hit that guy, that's 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 that guy. And so the, the how quick electricity goes is because it's not this one making it the entire way, it's this one making it to here, this one 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 to here, and this one to here. Now, if you have an electric field and you apply an electric field, you can have what is called electric potential energy. Electric potential energy works the same as gravitational potential energy. And what happens is if you put a charged particle in an area of electric potential energy, aka an area with electric field, is the electrons will move. And they'll go from not moving to moving. That once they're moving, they'll go from having potential energy to kinetic energy. And one of the easiest ways to make an electric field is to have to create what's called a capacitor. Once again, I'm not going to get into it yet, or a battery. But you make something with a positive charge and make something with a negative charge. And you have an electric field between them. And when you put a charged particle in between it, it'll move with the electric field, turning the potential into kinetic. But the thing is, electric potential energy is very, very, very complicated. So most people don't talk about it. Instead of saying, what is, instead of saying what is the potential energy here and what is the potential energy there, they talk about the change in the potential energy. What is the potential energy here minus the potential energy there? And if I do a tiny bit more math to this that I'm not going to get into, I can talk about instead of the change in potential energy, I can talk about the potential difference. 
that the potential difference is just going to be a way to talk about what is the, it's related to the electric potential in one spot minus the electric potential in the other. And in fact, what it is, is it's going to be the work it takes to move an electron from one spot to another over its charge. Now, potential difference has a very, very long name being potential difference. No one ever uses the term potential difference. But potential difference is measured in the units of volts. And because it's used, measured in the units volts, most people call it voltage. But what voltage is, is, I wrote W over Q, but I say it this way. What voltage is, is the change in potential energy between two spots divided by the charge, or the work it takes to move an electron divided by its charge. And so voltage is just, yeah, change in electrical potential energy over charge or work over charge when you move something in a area field. Well, voltage uses the symbol V and uses the unit V, which makes life easy. Well, a volt is a joule per coulomb. And anytime you separate charged particles, you will have a voltage. Any questions? Does that make sense? OK. Now, let's say you start purposely applying voltage, that you make something like a battery. And this battery is going to apply a voltage. It's going to apply a voltage by having two plates, a, pos a positive negative. If you look at an actual battery, like you know, look at an actual battery. There's a positive terminal and a negative terminal. What that is, is it's causing an area with two different potential energies. You have two different potential energies. You have a voltage. This voltage, and really the Q normally for voltage is the charge of an electron because that's what moves in electricity. A circuit is a series of things put together in order to harness that, is taking something that has electrical energy, that has voltage, and using that voltage to convert the at energy to something else, to convert the electrical potential energy to, with a light bulb, to convert, convert it to luminous, or it's an engine moving like a toy car to turn it into mechanical. It's just any time you are taking the electric potential energy in a battery, in a device, in an anything, and using it to create something else. Once again, um, normally we work with voltage because we're always moving electrons, so we don't really have to worry about the charge. The charge is just negative 1.6 times 10 to negative 19. A circuit diagram is just a way to map the path of a circuit. And I'll use set symbols to represent things. And going forward, I'm going to start doing circuit diagrams for a lot of this stuff. So I just want to cover what the symbols mean. Anytime you see a nice straight line, that's just a while. A battery will consist of two lines or perpendicular to the while, a long one and a short one. The long one is the positive terminal to the battery. The negative one is the negative terminal to the battery. And they're going to cause this voltage, cause the voltage that drives the circuit. Sometimes I have switches, and if I have a switch, it'll look like this open or close. That's to say something's going or not. And I got a whole bunch of other things to introduce. One is in two slides, but we'll get there. OK. Wow, I'm not getting very far today. I don't know about where I want to be. Never mind. Now, if you apply a voltage to a circuit, what's going to happen is it's going to Take electrical potential energy, turn it to kinetic. That when you apply a voltage, it's going to make those electrons start moving. And when those electrons start moving, there's going to be some resistance to that. Everything doesn't really like to start moving once it's not moving. And what's going to happen is that material itself, how it's made up, how the electrons are held in place, is going to say how easily you can make those electrons move. This is called resistance. Resistance uses the symbol O, capital O, and is measured in the unit of ohms, which is a capital omega. It's just a way of saying how readily you can make an electron move. And is defined 
such that V equals I O. V equals I O is known as Ohm's law. And what it says is that anytime you apply a voltage on a circuit, that that voltage will equal to the current in the circuit times the resistance of the material. Well, the resistance of a material is a little complicated. You can change it a whole bunch of ways, but it's just how much you can allow it to move. That, yeah, the voltage is the electric potential energy. That's the driving force. Well, it's not the electric potential. It's related to electric potential energy. That's the driving force. The current is the actual flow, and resistance is how much you allow the flow to happen. Now, when you create a circuit, you like to control how much resistance. You control how much resistance by adding resistors. Resistors are just special materials that have a set amount of resistance. See, general idea is all material has some resistance, unless you have a superconductor. Superconductors are complicated. We're not going to get there. A wire usually has very, 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 very low resistance. But in order to regulate a current versus voltage, you often want to have a certain amount of resistance. And when you add a resistor, it is just an object of known resistance, an object that you know exactly what the resistance is. And if you know exactly what the resistance is, and you have a battery where you know exactly what the voltage is, you can control what the current is. That a resistor is just a way to control the current by messing with Ohm's law. Now, in a circuit diagram, I will often draw resistors. I will draw a resistor with the zigzag line. That anytime you see a zigzag like that, that represents a resistor. Question so far? Now, how this all works in a circuit is the voltage pushes the current. Resistance restricts it. One of the good um, ways to see that I've seen is this water wheel idea. That let's say you hook a battery up to a light bulb, right? The battery supplies a voltage. That voltage is going to create a current. That current will cause the bulb to light up, where the bulb is actually a resistor. Um, old school light bulbs, or old school light bulbs, resistor, like the Regular light bulb, not an LED, not an incandescent fluorescent. They work differently. But an old school light bulb is a filament in it. It's just a big resistor. That's a big resistor that, um, I'll get into that later on. I'm going to talk about light bulbs later on. This is the same idea as a water pump. Let's say you got a water pump that's going to pull water up through a valve, and the water is going to fall onto a water wheel, causing it to spin. If my water wheel idea, this pump causes the water to move. That is the same as the voltage. That the water, the pump pulls the water up just like the voltage pushes the electrons around. It's the same idea. In my circuit, the light bulb is the resistance. It's going to keep it from happening. And because it has resistance, it does work. Because it has resistance, it creates heat and light. In my water wheel idea, this would be the valve. And that if I close the valve, I can restrict the flow. A resistor restricts the flow. Just like here, this valve restricts the flow. Here, how much flow it is will be how fast the wheel spins. In the light bulb, how much flow there is will be how the bulb glows. OK? Now. When you have a current in a circuit, you have a voltage causing a current with a certain amount of resistance. It will take work to overcome the resistance. Resistance is trying to keep it from happening, that you are overcoming. If it takes work to overcome resistance, it'll take power. Don't forget that power is work over time. But in this chapter, I said that voltage is work over charge. And power is work over time. If I put that together, I get that power is voltage times charge over time. But charge over time is current. And what this says is any time you have resistance, there will be a certain amount of power dissipated. In the case of that incandescent light bulb, not incandescent, um, yeah, incandescent light bulb, right word, that power will be in heat and light. That you plug in a light bulb, it glows. That's the power that is lost. And the power lost through any resistor is given as IV. 
that the power given is given as the current times the voltage. Now keep in mind, we also know Ohm's law, V equals IL. If I take V equals IL and plug it into here, I can also get a different equation that P equals I squared all. Um, if I rearrange, I can also get that P equals um, V squared over all. If I just plug in Ohm's law differently. But all of these are the same equation, just putting these two together. And the general idea is the power dissipated in the circuit can be fined. In fact, if you, for any circuit with a resistor, you're going to have voltage, current, resistance, and power. If you know any two of these, you can solve for the, the remaining two. Because you can put these two equations together in 12 different ways. There was something known as the electrician's circle. Um, some of you might be familiar with the ugly book. If you're familiar with the ugly book, it's right on the cover of it. This is the electrician's circle. The electrician's circle says, take those two laws, V equals IL and P equals IV. If you want to solve for any term, this says every single possible equation to solve for the rest. What it is, is if you want to solve for something, let's say I wanted to solve for all. If I want to solve for all, I'll go to the bit of the circle where all is in the middle. Every equation I could use to solve for all are the ones here. Anytime you're going to be solving for any of these terms, pull up the circle. Whatever you're solving for, go to that quadrant of my circle and use whichever of the three equations matches what you know. If I want to solve for voltage, I say, OK, if I want to solve for voltage, I have these three equations. And I look, do I know I and all, or do I know P and all, or do I know P and I? That's how I decide which one to use. Good so far? Now this power dissipated, normally in a circuit is in heat. For the most part, an electric light bulb, the old school light bulb, they get really hot. In fact, they lose, they only 5% of a light bulb goes towards light. The, uh, 95% goes towards heat. For those reasons in the circuit, people sometimes talk about I squared all losses. Since one of the equations for power, I'm going to jump back real fast. One of the equations for power is I squared all, right here. And so um, I squared all loss in, a, in an electric, in a circuit is just saying how much heat is lost to heat. Sometimes that's the goal. Electric stove, heater, cooking range, hair dryer, that is the goal to create heat. You just put a very, um, very low resistance, very high current to cause heat. An incandescent light bulb, most of the energy goes to heat. Only 5% is physical light. But that's why we talk about the wattage of a light bulb. When you talk about how many watts a light bulb is, you're just saying the power output. And that's going to be related to how bright it is. Um, fun fact, LED light bulbs, um, it's like 99.9% .9 of the energy goes to light. That's why people are telling you, that's why we're moving to LED light bulbs. It wastes a lot less heat. We ever hear someone talk about I squared, lo I squared all loss? They're just talking about the power, how much power is lost to heat. Okay, let's do an example problem with my two minutes left. Let's say I got a 60 watt light bulb in a 120 volt circuit. What's the current and resistance? What I'll do is I'll look at what I know. 60 watt, 120 volts. And I'll put up my circle and say, I want current and resistance. So what I'm going to do is I'll just start with one of them. I said current and resistance, so let's start with current. If I want to solve for current, I'll go to my symbol and I'll find where current is. It's right there. Let's say I have three equations for current, V and all, P and V, P and all. I know P and V. So let's use the P and V equation. Current equals P over V. So current is 60 watts over 120 volts. It's a half an amp. What's the resistance? If I want to solve for resistance, I'll go to my all equations. And I say, I let's, let's go crazy with colors. 
V, I know V. I know P. And in this case, see how that shows up. Nope, that doesn't show up at all. I also know I. And so I'll look at the equation and say, I know everything. I can use any equation I want. So I'll just pick one. When in doubt, I always use the one that don't involve squaring things, because the less math you have to do, the less you let mess up. So I would use V over I, just to make sure I don't make a mistake. And I'll just say 120 volts over 0.5 amps. That's 240 ohms. Any questions? OK, we're going to stop there. Um,